developing experiments to test these 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 questions. Um, but today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about some stuff I've worked on in the past, uh, specifically related to uh, robotic exoskeletons. And so, um, specifically, this talk we're going to focus on exoskeletons related for standing and walking after someone has had a stroke. So for example, some terms and things we'll talk about today are powered exoskeletons, unpowered exoskeletons, rigid versus soft, and orthoses. And I'm gonna go into some minor details on some design and application and developing in this field, how, how, um, how that approach works and what's kind of going on right now. So most of this stuff will be pretty up to date at least in the last five years and some newer stuff in the last six months sort of thing. Uh, so it's pretty up to date, which is, um, which is good because this field moves very quickly. So just, just a tiny bit of background. Um, I started my PhD here in 2017 and prior to that I was at Harvard working on a stroke project for the NIH where we developed lower limb robotics for people with stroke. And that was, um, my role there was a mechanical engineer and researcher, where we also collaborated with the physical therapy department, physical therapy department at Boston University, uh, where I continue to do projects with to, to this day. Uh, prior to that, I was a master's student at Queens, working on, on modeling and understanding human motion. And prior to that, I did my, ma my undergrad in, in mechanical engineering um, with an interest in biomechanics. Okay, so physical therapy like is um, repetitive and intense and demanding. And if you look at this video, is this video working for you guys? Okay, they work. Okay, cool. So you can, this is a kind of an example of when someone who has had a, a disability or has injured, this is kind of what sometimes happens in the physical therapy in the gym where here someone is relearning or training to walk and you can see that this is maybe a little bit exaggerated but you can kind of see that these people physical therapists are assisting this person in walking and giving them practice right so the idea here is that it's very focused and repetitive intense and demanding for the for the person uh, but another thing you can notice is that because it's so repetitive and predictable, this is a, an ideal situation for um, a robot because uh, the repetition is there, uh, the control outcomes are clear, and um, a robot can also replace three people doing this high intensity uh, maneuver for this person. Here we go. So, very early on, we started developing these passive mechanical orthoses, which were essentially just a rigid exoskeleton for the legs. So it would attach on the outside of the body and provide support for people. Uh, for example, essentially just think of it as a bunch of metal rods that attach in parallel to the bones uh, and provide support or stiffness where needed for someone who has trouble walking. And in many cases, these require uh, using crutches. And you can kind of imagine just even just by looking at something like this, that it's probably not very comfortable um, limiting the range of motion of someone to walk. And this is also going to reduce their desire to use a device like this. So one popular trans trans translation from using these rigid devices that had no power is the is the locomat so the idea is the exact same thing except now you attach a bunch of motors to the rigid bars in parallel to the leg and the motors move the leg so that the person can walk so here's an example of of that and i'm going to show you a video of of this in use but this is essentially the idea for this is that it's used when someone has when someone loses the ability to walk completely or they can't stand at all. So for example, after they have a spinal cord injury, uh, using something for this 
like this for stroke would be an overkill because people after stroke are able to still walk and maintain upright stability. But people after a spinal cord injury, like they can't stand up or do anything like that. So a machine like this provides them with the ability to stand and move their legs. So here's just an example of that. Um, this is a really fast video, but this would be considered a powered exoskeleton. And here the person has a spinal cord injury and the robot is moving their legs on the treadmill for them. So it's really bulky and also constrained to the treadmill, but it provides a lot of opportunities in physical therapy. So you, the first kind of thought is like, okay, how can we translate this from a treadmill to something that's less constrained? So people for, I guess this is from the eighties have been trying to develop for a while now, the translation of something that's not constrained to one spot. So the way this would work is you now attach the motors onto the person and the whole system is now part of the person. And in the early days, this was almost completely infeasible for use because it was so heavy and uncomfortable and really difficult to develop proper control algorithms to control the legs because we didn't have the sensors we need and the battery and the, all these other things that we didn't have. So the, the, this technology has sort of been around for a while, but not really in use at all until the last, I would say maybe 10 years. So the most modern version of this uh, now, this is on, the, on this picture here, um, is essentially that whole thing you saw on the treadmill that was big and bulky is now this compressed and simple in some one sense device that has all these motors and everything integrated into the device that the person wears on their body. And this allows people with, who have had lost the ability to walk, their ability to stand and walk on their own, as you can see here. And this is hugely beneficial because this allows them to load their bones, uh, makes them more mobile, not just sitting in a wheelchair. And this leads to reduced infections and in general, just an increased sense of worth, which is probably the most important thing there because now you're able to stand up, wash the dishes and move around the house and you're not constrained to uh, a wheelchair. Sorry, keep beeping. And um, let's just use the video should work here. And this technology, has been useful for other clinical populations. Uh, for example, in children with CP, we're developing child size exoskeletons to assist them uh, in walking. And maybe when you do this at an early stage, the, the child can develop the ability to walk better uh, when they get older. So this is sort of happening right now. Uh, there's a lot of studies looking into developing pediatric exoskeletons specifically targeted at CP to help kids regain mobility and learn how to walk better more and more efficiently. But the, the talk, the, my, my general focus today and like sort of what I'm um, focused on in my area is stroke. So specifically people who have had uh, hemiparesis on one side. So they, one side of their body is essentially not as functional as the other side of the body. And stroke is, is important to understand that stroke is like one of the leading causes of disability, I think, in, in America. Or there's a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people have a stroke. And so there's a lot of this costs a lot of money. So we need to develop technology to help uh, help these people. And this is from 2017, but I think about 800,000 people a year and, and this number has gone up since then are affected with stroke every year. So probably upwards of a million people a year. And that's just in the States. Um, can you hear this? People with movement disorders is just staggering. There's almost a million people every year who suffer a stroke in the United States alone. Multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, the list goes on. My brain absolutely doesn't exist. It affects pretty much everything. Every single day, it's weird to So, 
when someone has a stroke, the biggest problem after they have a stroke is that they, they are sedentary and they don't move. And the reason for that is it's very difficult and energy consuming to do simple tasks. So what happens is that they tend to just do the easiest option, which is doing nothing and remaining sedentary. And so this is a huge problem and we have to, we have to address this by helping them. And one way to do that is with these robotic exoskeletons. So stroke gait specifically has several very distinct characteristics that you guys should be aware of. And I've listed some of them here, but um, in maybe in order, but there's an inadequate dorsiflexion of the foot, which is also called drop foot. foot. There's weakness of the planar flexor causing a decreased push off. So when your foot is pushing off, the amount of forces generated during the push off is inadequate. So the foot, so the one side of the body that the foot is pushing off is going to be asymmetrical. And this can lead to the person tripping and falling. And since there's asymmetry and one side of the body is weaker, this overall increases the metabolic effort to walk. So the person consumes more energy because of these inefficiencies. And as a, as a result of all of these things, they also develop these compensatory mechanisms in their gait, such as circumduction, which is them swinging their leg out, or hip hiking, which is like rising the hip up. And they do these things in order to clear the foot off the ground and not trip and fall. So just keep those in mind. Those are like, I would say the top five characteristics of hemiparatic gait, uh, but there's more. Um, but yeah, let's keep those in mind. So a common thing that is prescribed after a stroke that is completely passive are these, um, these orthoses for the ankle, where they essentially constrain the ankle to be in, in one position. And this is shown to be pretty effective and it reduces, it reduces some, some gait characteristics that are problems in walking after a stroke. So for example, people uh, are tripping less, but a, a big problem is that once you put this brace on, there's no range of motion and no natural motion in that foot. So they, people don't really want to wear this all the time. It's uncomfortable and it's not actually improving their ability to walk without it. So just a recap to what I showed you in the beginning with the physical therapy and a robot is good at, you can imagine developing a robot for this situation for someone after a stroke because a robot can perform these movements and there's control here and we can replace these, these expensive physical therapists who are doing this labor intensive task. So what we developed um, at the lab I was working in is a pretty simple device that attaches to the leg. And some of the key differences of the things that I showed you before, the first thing is that this is a soft robot. So there's, there are no rigid metal poles. It's essentially wraps around the calf and the hip. And we use uh, bike cables that provide uh, dorsiflexor, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion assistance. So the bike cables pull on the ankle at appropriate times to move the foot. I'm not sure if you, can you guys see my mouse? Maybe not. Hey, Paolo, there's a quick question on the last slide, I think from somebody in the chat. Okay, sorry, I can't see the chat. Okay, what an asymmetric, I, I can see it now, thank you. No problem. Yeah, so an asymmetric gait. So the question is, would an asymmetric gait cause other problems such as hip or knee pain? Yes, a lot of, totally a lot of different problems because you're loading one side of the body totally differently than the other side of the body. So there's a lot of associated problems with that, such as pain um, and an increased metabolic effort and all sorts of other problems. So I can't seem to get my pointer to go or annotate. It's okay though. So on the left side here in this, in this slide, 
is the planar flexor module. And the, when the bike cable pulls, it develops a torque on the ankle. And on the right side, that planar flex is, sorry, the, the ankle. And on the right side is the dorsiflexion module. So when the bike cable pulls there, which is another bike cable, it, it develops a dorsiflexion torque on the ankle. And there's essentially an actuator that pulls the cable at the appropriate time when the person is walking. And this would happen at the time where, where their muscle would actually be doing this. But since their muscle can't do this because they had a stroke, this robot is helping them do it. So what that looks like, just a little bit closer, you can see in this picture, there is the two cables. And on the cables, we attach sensors that tell us in, in real time how much force the cable is pulling on the ankle. And then we have an algorithm that knows where the foot is in their gait cycle. And we program it to pull at a specific instant and then let go at another instant. So when the person walks, this works, this would work in parallel to their muscles. And so when we were developing this, uh, it just started as a proof of concept where we used uh, really big motors and really bulky equipment that was sort of not integrated as one unit on the person. But the evolution of this was from this big system became smaller and smaller as we realized the parameters of the of the motor that we needed. So uh, on the right is the most, I guess, the 2019-2018 version of the actuator, really small and on, on it just sits on the person's hip. And a big problem when you're developing these soft robots is attaching things to the body is very difficult because things move. Like think about shoes. We've been developing shoes for I don't know, 150 years or probably more. And to this day, we're still getting blisters on our shoes. Like we're really not good at attaching things to the body. Um, and so you can imagine when now we attach things in the body and there's cables and there's forces being exerted, uh, this can create a lot of irritation and, and discomforts and things can also slide, which is a big problem. So the development of the, the, the part that's attached to the person was a huge, uh, huge collaboration with a lot of different people in, in industrial design and in people who make sports clothing. And this is one of the biggest challenges actually in developing these, these soft robots for people. So yeah, um, it became, it was initially like a lot of pieces and now it's just essentially one piece on the calf. That has a lot of, uh, a lot of very innovative technology in this industry in the cloth, like in the sports fabric development industry. I'm a little bit less versed on the, on this side, but it's, uh, it's an extremely complex problem, how, how to attach something to the body. And so very briefly, just to like put this all together, uh, the control algorithm uses sensors that are attached to these, these pieces of clothing, the soft robot. Uh, and the sensors are called IMUs. And essentially, they provide us with the orientation of the sensor and the accelerations of the sensor in three directions. So when you have multiple sensors, we can calculate, for example, the joint angles in real time. And um, we can calculate the step length, uh, step width, and all sorts of other parameters in real time to then develop an algorithm that tries to control these parameters in real time to some certain number that we want or the physical therapist wants. And if you look more closely at this algorithm, so here on this graph, the, the y-axis is the gait cycle, where zero is the, the heel hitting the ground. And 100% would be the next, that, that same heel hitting the ground again. And you can kind of see a picture of the gait cycle just above the graph. And the y-axis is the force that the exoskeleton is exerting on that bike cable, where the blue line is the planar flexion force and the red line is the dorsiflexion force. So if you look at this figure, you can see that in this specific control algorithm, we release and we pull either the dorsiflexion force or the planar flexion force at specific times of the gait cycle. 
to provide the patient with adequate forces so that they develop enough force on their foot to push off. And this reduces, for example, their asymmetry when they're walking. And I'll show you some, some results specifically that we calculated. Uh, the, yeah, go ahead. A quick question for, so for when this robot is functioning while you're walking, does it rely on you having a consistent gait? So if somebody is walking slower, will the sensors gauge that they're walking slower and activate at different times? Or is it assuming that they're walking at a consistent pace? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's a huge, in the beginning of this, when we were developing this, we did everything extremely constrained on a treadmill at one specific speed. Uh, because if you, for example, there's really high consequence here. If you, if your algorithm makes a mistake and pulls the wrong time, the person can trip and fall, right? So when we're developing this, we originally do everything extremely constrained and on the treadmill. And then as we gain confidence in our alg algorithm, we then move towards the overground and we would then develop control algorithms where we specifically get someone to be very variable and we test the robustness of our algorithm. And when we do this in the gate lab, the person is always attached to a tether to the ceiling. So they're not gonna just fall. Um, but a big thing that happens behind the scenes is that we are worrying, we are testing these on ourselves and we're causing like the most crazy, you know, like unusual things and to see how the system reacts. And um, some of this stuff is very complicated because you can't always plan for how someone's going to move and everyone's so variable. So you need to develop safety in these systems so that when it is used outside of the lab, uh, we have some confidence. It's not going to cause like a perturbation to someone. Uh, but this is, this is challenging and especially because there's so much variability in stroke gait and when someone has different levels of disability. Okay. So, um, so on the left is uh, version one of the system that was mobile and absolutely crazy amount of wires. And um, here the person is also outfitted, outfitted with uh, motion capture markers that we use to study their motion in the lab. And here they're also wearing EMG and other sorts of uh, physiological measuring uh, devices so that we can understand how their body is reacting to this device in, in in the lab and on the right is someone walking over ground in the lab wearing a more modern version of the device and this is typically in, in a research environment uh, what this would look like so for anybody for when, when you're working with um, with people that are that have like stroke or CP or any sort of a clinical population, there always has to be a physical therapist in the lab with us. Um, and the person is always harnessed, harnessed in so that they don't trip and fall. And we use force plates on the ground to measure the forces they exert. And we use motion capture to, to capture their motion. And then we put all this together to better understand some of the parameters. And I'm going to go over in my presentation about some of these parameters we look at. But this is generally what it looks like in the in the research lab. Okay, so on the left here is someone walking and the robot is turned off. And on the right, the robot is turned on. So if you look closely, you can see some some key differences in the in this person's ability to walk. And so um, it's really, really hard to see sometimes like with your eyes. Uh, so that's why we have, we're, we, we have and collect this data in the motion capture lab where we can actually quantify specific variables. But even in this video, you can see that uh, the person's ankle uh, was more stable. Like it was, uh, there was less inversion and they were circumducting less. So like they didn't swing their foot out as much as a result of the exoskeleton helping them out. But we need to actually quantify these to get a really good idea of, of how much something is changing when they're using the device. Um, so in the lab, this is another, another view of what this would look like in the research lab. 
Uh, so here we have someone walking and they're outfitted wearing our device. And oops. And they're wearing a mask where we can medic measure their metabolic energy expenditure, which is a variable outcome, an outcome variable that we're interested in. And they're walking on this treadmill and the treadmill measures the forces they exert on the ground. And there's motion capture cameras again. And again, we have the physical therapist uh, here who always has to be on scene in the research lab. Um, and you can see that they're, they're, they're strapped into the ceiling. So well, this is typically what it would look like in the research lab. Uh, just one note, the, when someone comes in for these research studies, it takes about an hour to set them up before we can start collecting data. So it, it's quite time in, intensive. And we're very thankful to the, the, the participants who are just volunteers who come in for these studies. Because it's quite time consuming. Okay, are there any questions like up until now? I know I'm just trying to see if I can get this going. Everybody good? Andy, I know you got to go. I don't, I'm going now, but yeah. you're doing nicely. Keep walking at the same rate. It was good. I'm Thanks. hoping there'll be more questions, but maybe <laughs> everything's <will> clear. <laughs> okay. Okay, see you. Bye. Okay, cool. Um, I probably have like another 10 minutes, so bear with me here. Um, I'll show you some of the results and some cool things that are in this field. Um, and I really want to give you guys like an idea of, of the research side of things, because I know some of you may be interested in doing research uh, and maybe have never seen some of this stuff before. So at any point in time, just like feel free to interrupt and I'd love to provide you with more information or even offline after, after this presentation. Okay, so the person comes into the lab, we have our device and we want to test it. So we want to get some, some variables and study like what this device is actually doing to the person. Um, well, here's another video. This is just like us testing a different device um, on a healthy person. Uh, but this is just, just giving you an idea of like what it looks like in the testing sessions. Okay, so I mentioned in the, like in the beginning that there are some important outcomes in stroke gait that we're interested in. And one of those variables is circumduction and hip hiking. So circumduction, again, is when they're walking, they swing their leg out in order to not trip and fall during each step. And we really want to reduce this because it takes a lot of energy to swing the leg out every step. You can try this at home and walk yourself. You're going to be walking with at least 10% more energy if you're walking like this for a long time because it's very costly and our bodies are not designed to swing our leg out or lift our hips up every time we walk. So one outcome measure that we had in one specific study with this device was to reduce, to see if we can reduce these, these, these specific metrics. And on this figure here, essentially what we showed is that when the, when the device is turned on, uh, these metrics are substantially and significantly reduced. So the person is cir circum circumducting less and hip hiking less. So the, the top figure here shows the, the foot the foot center of mass uh, in time. So the, the X and Y are both positioned and it goes through one full gait cycle. And you can see the red is when the device is turned on and the gray is when the device is turned off. So there's a reduction. And the same thing for hip hiking. But one, one quick question for, for circumduction and hip hiking, are there certain other injuries other than like stroke and CB that could cause somebody to rely on that motion to walk? Yeah, totally. Like um, all sorts of different like muscle weaknesses and uh, pathologies can cause this. Um, essentially, this happens when the person is unable or not confident that their foot is going to clear the ground during each step. So probably some of you may have experienced this even like when you have a simple injury like when one of one of your leg, like feet hurt you might do something to like put more load on one side and like move the other side a little bit awkwardly during each step because you're like you're scared because it hurts or like you're not confident in that foot so this is actually something that's 
not specific to stroke patients, but it is very common in hemiparatic gait, uh, where we see a lot of this as a strategy to not trip and fall. So that's why the clinical, that's why we had this clinical study, uh, because people are interested in this, in this variable outcome. Okay, so um, here just a bar graph of that. There is a 27% reduction in hip hiking and a 20% reduction in circumduction. And I believe this study had eight participants in it. Uh, so some other measures of interest that we're interested in, and this is a recap again, is we want to know how it affects the compensatory gait measures. So for example, these two measures. And another interesting thing is we want to understand does this have an effect on the metabolic cost of walking for this person? Because that's really, really important. If, if this robot means, if wearing this robot means that they're using less energy, like this is something we're really interested in because if people use less energy, they tend to walk more. Um, how does this improve the kinematics and kinetics? And does it increase the propulsion forces on the ground? So those are some other biomechanical parameters that we're interested in. Is anybody like unclear about any of these terms here? Okay, well, I have a slide coming up that clarifies some of them just in case. Um, it's okay if you're not clear because I know like this stuff is not exactly like, I'm not sure if you guys go over all these terms in this course or other courses, um, but I know in general people get confused with like kinematics and kinetics. So I have a slide coming up for that just in case there is any confusion. Um, wow, this is a very loaded slide here, but um, let's maybe just look at these figures here. And this is pretty easy to understand here. So um, what we found is if you look at the top graph here, the X axis is uh, an improvement in the symmetry of the propulsion. So the propulsion is the amount of force you de develop when you're pushing off. And so the X axis here is just uh, how much does this, the symmetry improve between both feet? So we wanna get both feet generating the same amount of force. So we wanna see how much it improves. So that's the X axis. And then the, the Y axis is an improvement in the amount of energy used. So people are more symmetrical on their forces and they use less as a result, they use less energy. So we see this really nice linear relationship, which is what we would want to see. So the more that the specific person, which is each dot represents a subject, the more that that person improved in their symmetry in the propulsion, the less energy they use to walk. So this is a really, really nice finding. And on the bottom axis here, um, we, can, we, we use the device at, and we look at their usual walking speed and now we're, with wearing the device, we see uh, an improvement in the symmetry of propulsion. So these graph, maybe it's a little bit confusing, but overall they're more symmetrical and they use less energy when wearing these devices. That's the main goal idea here. I'm gonna skip through all these other graphs, um, but they pretty much show that we saw improvements in all of the outcomes that we were interested in. Okay, very quick recap here. Um, kinetics and Kinematics. So kinematics would be anything that describes the motion. So for example, um, the angle of the ankle or the velocity of the ankle, that is kinematics. So like hip, knee, all these things that describe the motion. And then the kinetics is when you put the forces in. So the forces on the ground, when we have the forces on the ground and we have the motion, we can calculate for example, the joint moment or the joint power that that ankle is exerting or the knee is exerting or the hip is exerting. And so that's, that's coined kinetics. So when the forces are involved, it's kinetics. When there's no forces, it's the kinematics. And this, this term is sometimes mixed up. So just wanna make sure that that's clear. There's a okay. question in the chat. Okay. Um, can someone, uh, so I can to okay, so there's a question in the chat. For patients with stroke injuries, do you find that the exoskeleton is beneficial in helping them reestablish a normal gait cycle without developing a dependency long-term? Right, this is a great question. So 
you can imagine if they wore this device all the time, their muscle would atrophy. And uh, when they take it off, they would be actually worse off. So this is something that the, the, the physical therapy, like research um, labs are, are looking into how to develop like, regimes where they integrate a device like this into a person's um, physical therapy like routine. So the idea here is that the person wouldn't be like wearing this at home. They would come into uh, into physical therapy sessions and use this device as a way to improve their physical therapy sessions uh, because they can get a lot more intensity and a lot more out of this than when just the physical therapist without a device like this is doing a one hour session with them on the treadmill or something right I think it was like I don't know maybe I'm a bit off on this but like ten times more intensity because they can do a lot more things in an hour. Um, but that's the general idea. And there are studies, if you look online, of, of devices in this realm where they're integrated into daily life. Um, but I'm not 100% sure like, of how effective that is because once you take off the device and you, you, the device is doing the work for you the whole time, you might actually be worse off. So this is like a, a something we really have to like think about all the time. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so I'm almost done. So here's a video that we took of a stroke patient walking on a treadmill, and then while wearing the device, and it just kind of like, like just kind of shows you the, the cool like what it looks like. And this is the lab. Okay, it's gonna move forward. Okay, I'm almost done, but I just wanted to, my last couple slides here, just wanted to conclude about some other things that is happening in this research field that are really interesting and providing us with more information about the biomechanics of the person. Uh, so for any of you that have taken like James Wakeling's course or have been involved in his lab, uh, he does EMG of muscles. So you can kind of imagine using, uh, so not EMG of muscles, um, ultrasound of muscles. Uh, so you can imagine we can use ultrasound in these exoskeleton studies to get a visual image of what the muscle is doing in real time to better understand what's actually going on beneath uh, the skin. So there are many studies now that are using ultrasound and exoskeletons and getting real-time ultrasound and using that ultrasound and the measure of the muscle fascicle lengths as an input to the, to the control loop. So they're developing algorithms that take in even more parameters and more information about the, the specific real-time physiology of the person. Um, and they're finding that they can develop better algorithms and provide more assistance to people. So this is really exciting and, and interesting, uh, but only feasible in the, the recent years because of constraints on uh, the size of these measuring tools and the ability of it of them to provide information fast enough in real time. So this is really exciting and something I'm like really stoked about that's happening right now in this in this field. So using ultrasound in real time integrating ultrasound into the devices. So that product, the device I was showing you in the beginning is now like a product and has been licensed with uh, Rewalk Robotics in the United States. And this is in clinical trial, I think in like 10 places in the United States right now. Uh, so it was exciting to work on this project from start to now it is used in the real world in some capacity. So outside of the lab. So translating, this was exciting because it translated outside of the lab and is now being used to help people. Um, and there's a lot of studies still happening, but um, the technology is out there and being used in, in physical therapy uh, hospitals in the United States. Okay, almost done here. Just to conclude, uh, the use of exoskeletons uh, is, is interesting for not only helping people with disabilities, but another thing that I'm really interested in is actually augmenting uh, healthy performance. Uh, so what I mean by that is, for example, making people run faster and jump higher uh, or use less energy to do like daily tasks. 
uh, and we can use this to study the physiology of people. So we took the application from stroke and developed the same concept with bicycle cables, um, but to assist someone in running. So here is me running on a treadmill and this is like a very early prototype. And I think this video zooms in. But the bicycle cables essentially pull and it's just the whole same idea as we use with the stroke. And we were just interested to see if, if, we, if we develop something like this that works in parallel to my muscles, uh, can I run at one speed while using less energy to do so? And by doing so, I would augment my performance, right? Because if I didn't have the device, I'd be running at one speed with one energy, but now I'm running at the same speed with less energy. So augmentation of performance is an interesting field as well. If for anyone interested in sports, um, there's all sorts of things going on with augmenting and understanding how we can like manipulate the physiology in interesting ways that uh, make it better than what we evolved to be. And one more thing here is, um, well, here's that. Here, here's just another video in the in the lab. It's my friend John walking. If you can hear the audio, it's pretty loud, these devices. They're not quiet. <laughs> okay, it's gonna move forward. Um, so this is my last slide. And in some sense, like the most exciting slide, for, I think. Um, so a research group out in, um, at Stanford, uh, was so was interested in developing a device to help people use less energy and uh, so we showed with our device that was the mechanical device with the with the cables that people can run using less energy when they have assistance and that device was like maybe twenty five thousand dollars like it was quite expensive and complicated and like not practical and these guys they they essentially went to Home Depot and they bought like a rubber band and <laughs> They attached it in between the legs. So now there's a spring between the two legs when someone's running. And when one foot is in the front, it, the spring pulls the back foot forward. So it stores and releases energy. And what they showed was that when they, you do this, um, the cost of swinging the leg during the run is reduced because the spring is doing that work. So I, I think the whole thing costs like five cents. And people would run and they had like an increase, they like use less energy than they did on our device overall when running. So let me just show you a video. Um, you can actually make this at home. So it's just a rubber band attached between the legs. And it took quite a bit of time to learn how to run like this without like tripping and falling, but they figured it out. And uh, I believe people had a 5% reduction in their metabolic energe energetic cost of running and this is like really, really exciting because uh, it just kind of shows like how much we don't know and how much we can still learn and change about the human body. Wouldn't um, that elastic band also increase the energy expenditure needed for the foot to come forward? So you need, and in order to pull the back foot forward, don't you need to stretch the elastic by pulling your front foot forward? Yeah, so um, you can think of it this way. Like if the system has all this energy in it, it's essentially changing where the energy is used. So right. there's no there's no added energy in the system because the device is completely passive, mm -hmm. but it's changing when and where the energy is used. So it, you adapt a run where you're using the energy differently. Differently. Um, so yeah, you're you're using energy that is in the system to to stretch the spring, but mm -hmm. then it's storing it, let's say, for like a tenth of a second and then releasing it later. Yeah. Uh, so it's just changing the energy of the of the system, but not adding any energy here. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be considered what I call a, a passive exoskeleton. Uh, I know it seems like very simple, but it's still an external device that is assisting with human motion. Yeah, so you can actually try this at home and build it yourself. Um, just go to Home Depot and get like a rubber hose um, and just look at their paper. Uh, and they kind of, they, they provide all the information. Uh, so it's very exciting. Okay, that concludes my presentation for today. Um, I hope that you learned something and 
you're inspired. And if anyone like is, is more interest, is interested in learning more or has any questions about like doing research or is thinking about grad school, uh, like do not hesitate to email me. I'm happy to talk and like provide you with some advice or answer any questions you may have. Um, cause I know it's a big decision and, uh, sometimes there's a lot of unknowns. So if I can help in any way, like do not hesitate to email me. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. I hope, uh, hope that was interesting. Okay. So what happens now? I got to stop the recording. <laughs> it's weird presenting to like a virtual audience. I don't know, like,